This is a story about sailing, spearfishing, and Ciguatan, <gasps> where I set sail with someone I'd never met before, but through all our trials and adventures, turned out to be one of the best crew members I could have ever asked for. Then spearfishing with a bunch of absolute legends in this amazing underwater seascape, enjoying the very best of ocean life together. Till the last night when the worst of all our fears were realized and disaster struck, all but one of us poisoned with a mysterious toxin known simply as Ciguatera. This is a real look at just three weeks of my life at sea, but with so many memories and experiences of extreme highs and lows, feels more like an entire lifetime. This is my life of adventure. This entire story all begins about a month ago, back in St. Martin when I was anchored up on the French side, getting ready to sail dead downwind west, enjoying the trade winds pushing me along. Sometimes I choose to solo sail my boat, but other times I choose to take on crew. I have a bit of an elaborate interview process, but this one guy named Dylan got through everything. He interviewed with past crew members, answered all the questions correctly, and seemed like somebody who was really genuinely interested in coming on an adventure. So, he flew in. I was super excited to have him on the boat, and he was super excited to be here. Literally within the first couple hours of Dylan being on the boat, we already got into so many adventures. I took him out to go use the subnados in this underwater park. We ended up going rock climbing at sunset and I caught this baby goat. We're hanging out with Raph and Sasha, touring their sailboat, Spirit Animal. We made this thing we called the adventure board, which was really difficult to do. And honestly, I didn't think I had the time to do it, but we managed. Honestly, I got so caught up with so many things, I didn't even clean the bottom of my boat, but it was too late and we had to sail out. We were sailing dead downwind with some fairly light winds, which wasn't great to start with. But on top of that, I probably had about 10,000 barnacles on the bottom of the boat, further slowing me down. What should have taken us about 16 hours to do probably took us closer to 22 hours, I realized. It was kind of painful, but we had a beautiful night sail. Dylan was super excited. He had never sailed through the night before. And honestly, this and all the times before, he really started to shine as a crew member for me. He took the helm plenty. He made meals. He was always helping any way that he could. He was just doing everything right. It was great. Finally, in the dead of night, we made it all the way into Virgin Gorda to anchor pretty close to Sabo Rock Resort. It was dark, but we anchored up and then got a little bit of sleep. Now, I had a very special reason for going to Sabo Rock Resort. Normally, it's just not a place I could afford to be because it's literally known as the billionaire's playground. But through talking to some people there, I showed them my channel, and they were pretty impressed and they wanted me to stay and do a little bit of footage. So I was comped for a few nights stay there, meals, using all sorts of the toys, getting a mooring ball there. Ah, just check it out.
It was great. I got to live the high life. Dylan was a huge help yet again, doing tons of filming and always being there to support whatever project I had to work on while I was there. Although I was staying at this, you know, millionaire, billionaire's playground place, I really didn't get to enjoy myself at all. It was just go, go, go. That's really the theme of this video, you guys, is I got almost no rest from the moment, actually, from weeks before I left St. Martin all the way up until right now when I'm making this video. It's been flat out. But there were moments at Save a Rock Resort where I got to stay in the room, take a real hot shower, sleep in a big bed. It was pretty great, and I got tons of great footage. After that, we set sail from Virgin Gorda, which is pretty much the easternmost part of the Virgin Islands, all the way down through the Virgin Islands. I think the first night we made it into St. John, but Dylan was again great, taking the helm all the time that he could, which for me was really nice. I've sailed plenty, I don't need to be on the helm any more than I already do. So it was really cool to get to teach Dylan more and more about sailing. And that's what I want to have for my crew members. I want them to help me in exchange, I want to teach them all about this lifestyle. I showed Dylan how to sail on and off the anchor, and we sailed on through to St. Thomas the next morning, passing the infamous Jeffrey Epstein's Island. This is definitely a place shrouded in a lot of mystery and a lot of skepticism, but it was just interesting to sail past it. I managed to fly the drone while under sail and get a few of these shots for it. Now, once we sailed into St. Thomas, we're actually going to be right next to the International Airport. Kind of a loud place when the planes come in, but you get used to it and it's just such a calm anchorage. Plus, no flights come or go at night. But the real reason I was there was meet up with a guy named Blake Sparrow. He's another young sailor and I'm absolutely amazed what he's able to do on such a tight budget. But as well, we have a mutual friend, Captain Jack Spiro, who's going to be flying in. Together, we're planning on doing a few days of collaborating, spearfishing, and just having an absolute blast. The next day, Jack flew in, and we started to get a plan together of what we wanted to do. We were to spend the first day around the area spearfishing, and then the next day and the day after that, going out to Saba Island. Now, this might get kind of confusing, so I'll just explain it real quick. There's Saba the Country, there's Saba Rock Resort, which is completely different, and then there's Saba Island, which is also completely different. And they're all each either in a separate country or are a country. So keep that in mind. The following morning, we wanted to go get a spearfishing mission in, and there was no place closer than the airport jetty. So the airport comes out and it's all a man-made island. Maybe a little bit of it is actually on St. Thomas, but most of it extends out into the water to give them this nice flat airstrip. But what holds all that together from the sea taking it over are these huge concrete jacks. Now, these things make a ton of structure, so hopefully there'd be some fish there. So Jack and I were paired up together, and then our buddy Blake and his friend Lane were also paired up together. As well, my all-time favorite crew member, Dylan, was being great again, being in the dinghy, helping us. We call that being a boaty. And let me just put it this way, there's never a shortage of finding people that want to come spearfish with me, but finding people that actually want to help me by being in the dinghy, that I really prize. So again, Dylan was just doing a great job. I'm a bit ashamed to say this, but I was super out of practice from spearfishing. My breath hold was terrible, and Jack, to say the least, was doing great. He was hitting 80-foot drops, he was going down for two minutes plus, he was doing a really good job. Jack got a few fish that day, while I missed on a few fish, and that was pretty much it. We went to leave, and unfortunately we couldn't find the other two guys, and we actually got pretty scared. We went on a little search mission for them. Thankfully, we were able to find them, but it was definitely a close call that we didn't enjoy having a scare on. So we had a firm talk with the guys about being buddies and sticking together and staying where we can see them. But honestly, boys will be boys. The following morning, we set sail. Now, Jack had never really been sailing before, and he's considering getting a sailboat himself. So it's a big reason why he wanted to come out and collaborate with me and also see how I do my lifestyle on Adventureborn. So Jack hopped on board, and I showed him how I sail off the anchor with no motor. Dylan as well got to learn about this again, and honestly, it was one of the best sails I've ever had. We weren't going terribly fast, the bottom of my boat was still covered in barnacles, so I was going slow, but the wind direction was actually pressing the boat this time, we had more of a beam reach as we were going from the north to the south. We only had to go about five miles, so I mean, the trip went by really fast, we had so much fun. Then I started jumping off the bow of the boat, and it was kind of cool too, getting to see how Dylan would react being the most you know in charge, responsible person on the boat, if anything did happen to me. It's a good exercise to do, but obviously I was safe with it. I was able to grab back onto the boat as well. Then I started testing out my subnados, seeing if I could keep up with the sailboat. Now, I should have put on the quad setup that I've got that does four subnados, but unfortunately I didn't have any of that rigged up ready to go. Eventually, we got to Seba Island, and I gotta say, it was just absolutely gorgeous. It really was. It's a protected island, I believe, so you can't go on to more than the beach there, but the waters around it are good to spearfish, plenty of sea life. I was just happy to be in a place that I could actually spearfish again. So much of the Caribbean is either fished out or non-locals are not allowed to spearfish there, so being back in the Virgin Islands meant I could spearfish again. 
The spot I anchored in was a little bit further out than I wanted to be, but it didn't seem like there was any great place to anchor around there. The holding seemed good enough, although I was in, I think, close to like 26 or 28 feet of water, which was pretty deep for my boat to anchor. As well, the anchorage was super rolly, but it's the price you gotta pay, and I knew we'd only be there for a couple days. Within the hour, uh, one of the other guys got off to spearfishing, a guy named Lane, and this guy, I don't know how to explain him other than he's just, he's an absolute legend. He's built different, that's pretty much it. This guy goes out covered in zinc sunscreen and has all the worst gear of any of us and boom immediately gets a massive lobster i was so impressed by the guy he was super cool about it and we'd be enjoying that lobster later that day i knew but now i was pretty pumped so now it was my turn to get in the water dylan of course was being a great boaty for me again i think jack and the other guys were still working on some gear so we wanted to get a quick mission in so i went over and around the area where lane had just been obviously hoping to get a big lobster didn't get a big lobster but what i did get was one fish after another fish and so on and so forth to a total of five fish and the first fish i got was a bar jack which is a smaller jack i love eating them many people don't but as far as raw fish goes they really can't be beat it's one of those things where if i was to feed it to you you would think it was hamachi or something they're delicious as I was calling Dylan to come over to help me drop the fish off, a yellow jack swam in, so bam, I got that one. And with each one of these fish, I'm bleeding them, gilling and gutting them in the water. I wanted to see what the sharks were like in the area, and to be honest, I at least finally saw some sharks. I'm used to really fighting the sharks for my fish, but these sharks were so skittish, so no big deal there. But as I was discarding out the guts, another fish would come, and another fish, and another fish. So I think the next fish I ended up getting was a queen trigger fish. They're a delicious species, and I was really happy to get them. And then just below me ended up being a mutton snapper, so I got that one. And then just a little bit later, I got myself a strawberry grouper. So five delicious species, and all five of these species really not that big, and all of them not known to ever really carry ciguatera. Now, ciguatera, for those of you that don't know, is a toxin that derives itself from a microalgae that grows off the reefs. Now, I'm gonna be making a full video on this, but I don't wanna talk too much about it here, but here's a pot shot of it. Certain species that have different patterns or different hunting patterns along the reef, and it's only for reef fish, they accumulate this toxin through the other smaller feeder fish that are herbivores, and it just kind of goes up the chain. So for example, like a giant barracuda, you would never eat because it's gonna have a lot of this toxin in it, and it does affect humans, but it doesn't affect fish. So you would never know it until you actually go to eat it. So this was a huge concern for all of us. We knew that St. John and the St. Thomas, the US Virgin Islands is kind of known for ciguatera, but we were gonna be selective about the fish we took. So again, all five of these species here, I was seeing plenty others of these fish. They're plentiful, nothing's endangered, nothing's protected. These are delicious fish to be eating. And I was, again, just happy to be back on spearfishing. Again, Dylan was being an absolute champ in the dinghy, looking out for me, always ready to come help. He was a little bit afraid of sharks, let's be honest, but he really was there to help. And I really just gotta give him a lot of credit for that. So we get all those fish, Dylan's super stoked. He literally sees me go down, come up, go down, come up, and just boom, boom, boom. I think I did all of this in like half an hour, 45 minutes, which that's pretty good if you can keep that going. But I decided that was enough fish for the day that would at least feed everybody if I didn't want to freeze any of this fish. And I'll be honest with you guys, I had an empty freezer, so I could have put a lot more in there. But between our two boats, I was the only one that had a proper dinghy, so I wanted to make sure that I was helping everybody out the best way I could. I dinghied up and I found out where Jack was, and as well Blake, and we couldn't find Lane because again, he's built different. So I ended up towing them on their paddle boards over to the spot where Lane was. And it didn't take Lane long to get a permit, which one of the best fish you could get. And again, the way this species of fish goes, you can't get ciguatera from them. They don't eat the type of fish that would give it to you. They eat crabs. So this guy was just knocking it out of the park. Jack and I then went to do a dive around one of the other sides to give him some space. Again, Dylan watching our back. We had some really beautiful dives, saw a lot of fish, but we also saw a lot of fish that we didn't want to shoot, like really, really big dog snapper. Now this species is known to carry ciguatera, and these ones we thought were just a little bit too big, so it would have been great to have speared them, but we decided to leave them alone. Uh, went through the reef, I think we saw some lobster, but I wasn't quite quick enough, and they were pretty small anyway, so nothing lost there. Not like the big one that Lane had gotten that day. We ended up doing a few more dives around this rock, and we really enjoyed it, but we weren't seeing the fish that we wanted to, but there wasn't enough fish for the day, so we decided to call it a day and bring everything back home. That night, we decided to collaborate on all of our catches and do a huge feast aboard Adventure Born. So there was permit, there was lobster, I made poke, I made sushi rice, I made a miso soup. It was a really nice time, and this is what it's all about. This is why we love spearfishing, for the meals that it brings us together on. And the fish was delicious. 
Now, the next morning we got set out super early. Jack and I wanted to hit this wreck that was at about 90 feet deep. It's pushing it for me, but Jack can certainly hit those depths. He's a floated diver and much more used to diving that sort of terrain than I am. I'm still kind of getting back in the flow of things, having really not spearfished much in about a year. Again, the rest of the Caribbean is just horrible. There's pretty much no spearfishing to be had. I was very disappointed by it, to be honest, but very happy to be in the Virgin Islands and finally doing some spearfishing. That first wreck really didn't prove to have much on it. We even dropped some chum from all the fish we'd flayed the night before, but really nothing came up. So we scooted over a few miles to this pinnacle. Now this pinnacle did have quite a bit on it. Jack took a shot on a really big Hobera snapper. The reef that we were out on was much deeper, and I think the chance of getting Ciguatera out there was substantially smaller. And really, I think we should have stuck there more often. Just the diving was very difficult. Eventually though, Jack gets himself a massive king mackerel. This thing came in, Jack got it, and I was trying to help him pull it up, but he told me he had it, so I went to go on shark patrol, but unfortunately I took too long and a barracuda chopped off the tail. Not really the worst part to lose, but still frustrating to lose any part of a fish to the tax man. After that, Jack got himself a little mutton snapper that he was very happy with. Again, the species were not worried about having ciguatera, and then we decided to go over to the spot where Lane was the day before. Drifting that was awesome, and Jack was a true champ. He gave me the first shot that he could have easily taken on, I think two or three king mackerel that came by, but I was just out of range on pretty much all my shots. I kind of knew that I was uh, up to something, so they didn't give it to me, but the diving around this thing was fantastic. So after diving pretty much nonstop for three hours, we weren't even close to noon, and our friends Raph and Sash from the YouTube channel and the sailboat Spirit Animal finally got in. Now, this was all the plan to have all three of our boats all anchored here. We knew we'd have a good time. Everybody spearfishes, everybody sails, and you got three different YouTube channels there as well. So it was really cool getting to collaborate with everybody, see how everybody else films and how they do content. Something I really enjoy. While they came in, I made sure to give them some of my famous Zatarans coated uh, mutton snapper. It was so good, so good. I made sure to give everybody a little bit. It's just the best way to do fish, in my opinion. Uh, we gave Sash and Raph a little bit of time to get ready, let them get all their gear out and stuff. And then five Spiros, one Spira, and a Bodhi all took out for the island that we decided was the best spot, the original spot where Lane was just crushing it. We kind of dubbed the spot the secret lane because it was always producing something over there. Not only was Dylan being a great Bodhi, but he also managed to fly the drone, and I can't tell you how rare it is to get drone footage of myself or anybody I know spearfishing. It's so nice to have somebody else who can operate a drone, and again, this is why Dylan was just the best crew member ever. While he was filming, he actually managed to get some shots of me coming up with this nice bar jack that I had gotten. I managed to get two really nice bar jacks off of this, as well as a nice dog snapper that may have been a little bit big, so it was definitely a fish in question but I also managed to take a nice big lionfish off the reef. And I'm not exactly sure the science behind it, but I've never heard of anyone ever getting ciguatera from a lionfish. Dylan also managed to get this drone footage of Raph spearfishing a yellowjack. Yellowjack, similar to barjack, aren't known to be a good eating fish, but that's just because a lot of people, in my opinion, are a bit too snooty about it. Yellowjacks are great. Eat them raw, grill them up, they're delicious. Thing about buddy boating is, you know who has the best boat to entertain everybody on, and there was no doubt that Raph's 50-foot sailboat spirit animal was the one to be on. So we had a great night, we were able to fit everybody on there super comfortably, and they cooked up pretty much everything. Raph grilled up the yellow jack, he also grilled up, I believe, some mutton snapper, we had lobster to eat, everybody was feasting away, we were all so happy. Again, this is what it's all about. These are the memories we love making, and the people we love sharing these experiences with. Now, little did we know, we were all poisoning ourselves. Everyone, except for Sasha, decided to focus on the lobster that night because she hadn't had any in such a long time, versus all of us had eaten lobster the night before. But the fishing question that was poisoning all of us was the yellow jack that Raph shot earlier. Now, I want to take a quick minute and just explain this, that we all knew the risk for ciguatera there. In fact, myself, Jack, and Raph have all had ciguatera before, all three of us from a tiger grouper back in the Bahamas before we knew tiger grouper were a no-no species known to carry ciguatera. So as we were all eating this fish, we knew what the risk would be, and unfortunately, we ended up paying the price for this. I think at about two or three in the morning, I woke up not feeling very good, feeling kind of uncomfortable, but I kind of just chucked it off to being, oh, you know, a bit of a stomach ache, nothing really to worry about. But in fact, this was the beginning signs of ciguatera, gastrointestinal discomfort and pain. I was in a pretty delirious half sleep, half awake state, and we were planning on spearfishing at 6 a.m. that next morning, so I was kind of angry that I was up so early. And I was gonna text Jack to tell him that I wasn't up for spearfishing, but I didn't wanna be that guy that says that. I didn't wanna be the quitter. So I was trying to push through it, 
But then I think at about 4 a.m. I was firmly awake and I was thinking about the pain that I was going through and I realized this is Ciguatera. I looked at my phone and then Jack told me he had stomach problems and he didn't want to spearfish that morning. So technically Jack bugged out first. <laughs> but the downside is, is when he said that I realized it for sure. We all have Ciguatera. And I immediately did what I could. I have activated charcoal on the boat, which is known to absorb toxins and poisons. It's one of the best things you can do besides throwing it up. So I went over, made sure to get Jack some, made sure to get Blake some, made sure to get Lane some. And then I went over to Raph and Sasha's boat. I woke them up. They were gonna come with us as well, but they were pretty tired anyway. And I asked if they were feeling anything and both of them said no. Now, Raph had had the worst symptoms of all of us because he ate like the whole fish. He boiled it. Raph ate parts of that fish that are known to have a higher concentration of the cigatoxin versus Jack and I, when we'd eaten our fish that gave us cig, we only ate the fillets, which actually has the least amount. And that's actually what we ate that night. So imagine what would happen if we'd eaten the head, eaten, eaten it into a soup, or worst of all, for some reason, ate the liver. That's where the highest concentration of the toxin is. Pretty quickly though, I remember what we all needed to do and I told everybody, hey, if you're not already, start throwing up. Get as much of it out of your system as physically possible. Jack seemed to be in the worst condition. He was throwing up substantially and it didn't take long before Raph then felt the symptoms as well. Honestly, this was a huge downturn from such an amazing time that we were having. And this will now motivate me to be making a full video as well as talking with marine biologists that are actual experts in this field. Cigatera has been long since something of mystery and not a lot of science has been done on it. And there still really isn't, but there is a lot of misinformation I would like to put to bed and a lot of experts that can weigh in on what you can do and other things that you can be aware of. But again, this will be saved for next week's video, so be sure to tune into that one. So after going around to the two boats and making sure everybody had some activated charcoal and they knew what to do, I went back to my boat and Dylan was still asleep, so I didn't want to wake him up, but I began inducing vomiting for myself. Honestly, stuff like this just doesn't really bug me anymore. And this really is the end result for me, is while I'm making this video right now, I still feel the symptoms of Cigatera, but I'll be honest, you guys, I absolutely intend on spearing and eating reef fish again. I'm gonna be smarter about it for sure, but I'm gonna do it again because really, it's not that bad to keep me from something that I absolutely love. And even while I was throwing up, I knew all this. It's just part of the game. It's just the price I pay for this wonderful life I live. As the morning wore on, we realized that everybody was gonna be in fairly rough shape. Really, the only other one not really feeling much was Lane. Again, the guy's just built different. I don't know why it wasn't affecting him. <laughs> it's still a bit of a mystery. But either way, we all wanted to go back to our nice, comfortable anchorage because although Seba Island was gorgeous, the anchorage was rolly as could be, and we were all kind of sick of it. So I wanted to sail out of there. I was starting to feel a little bit better. But then once Dylan woke up, he started having some pretty bad pain and disorientation, muscle cramps, all the common symptoms of Ciguatera. So he was still a champ though, he powered through it. I told him, hey man, just help pick up the anchor and then we'll get out of here and you can just rest. I ended up opening up the gym, did a little bit of sailing on the way back, but mostly just motored it. Wanted to get back as quick as possible. I got the boat anchored back safe and sound. I told Dylan it was his time to finally get a chance to rest. He had done so much, he had helped out in every way that he could. I just wanted to make sure that he was doing well. And to be honest, this was my first chance to finally get a break, and guess what? I had Ciguatera. I knew that these two weeks leading up to this were gonna be absolutely intense. They're gonna be fun. They're gonna be full on and nonstop. And you gotta tell you guys, I like to have a break once in a while. But unfortunately, I had to compile video footage and I wanted to go over and see how Jack was doing. Jack was looking rough. That guy, I mean, I was feeling it, but he was feeling it. He ate way more of the Yellow Jack than any of us. I think he had six pieces. I think Raph had like three or four pieces. I think I had maybe two or three pieces. So it definitely was something that the more you had of it, the worse it was gonna be. Eventually, we all got some rest. Jack flew home. I was happy to be in this nice, secure anchorage, but we didn't have very long to be in there. And eventually, Dylan flew out. And as soon as Dylan flew out, it was my time to sail out. I enjoyed some beautiful sails going from St. Thomas all the way down to Vieques. And I gotta tell you guys, it was some of the best sailing I've ever had. The swell was with me. My boat was on a slight beam reach, and it was just beautiful sailing the whole way. My only regret is that Dylan wasn't there to enjoy it with me. And I gotta tell you guys again for the last time, Dylan, great crew member. He really helped and did everything he could in every way. And it made such a difference. He really was the best crew member. Now, about a month later from this nonstop adventure, I finally find myself in Puerto Rico at a marina just so that way I can go to Walmart. That's how much I need to go to Walmart just to resupply my boat. And I gotta tell you guys, it's been more than a year since I've been at a marina because this is the same one I was at all that time back. I live exclusively out on anchor, and I gotta tell you, it's fun, it saves me money, but it is so much work. It takes it out of me. And at this point, really, I wish I could just have a week to myself to just relax and chill. 
But as I say, you can sleep when you're dead, and I've got so much coming up. Okay, so now that all that's over, what's coming up next? Well, like I said, I'm gonna be producing that full-length video on Ciguatera, so do stick around for that. So let me know in the comments below which stories within this story you'd like me to fully edit. Like how I made the adventure board, the sailboat tour of Spirit Animal, the Subnado adventures I've been having, the collaboration with Sable Rock Resorts, and many more in this action-packed week. But I've got no shortage of things to do here. Day after tomorrow, my newest crew member flies in from Switzerland, and he'll be with me on this next sailing adventure, during which I'm gonna be sailing out here from Palmas del Mar, all the way under the south coast of Puerto Rico, then across the Mona Passage, about a 150 nautical mile passage to Samana. From there, I'm gonna be taking a few days to go south to Los Haitias. It's one of the parks in Samana Bay that supposedly looks a lot like Thailand. From there, I'm gonna sail up and around the north coast of the Dominican Republic, about a 150 nautical mile sail, all the way until I get to Lupron. Now, those of you that don't know, Lupron is a very interesting place to bring a sailboat. And you either love it or you hate it. And for me, I love it. There's a great sailing community there. The locals are wonderful and always smiling, always helpful, always friendly. The food is amazing. There's cheap places to rent. There's cheap motorcycles to rent, cool places to explore. I can go spearfishing, I can go kiteboarding. But best of all, I'm gonna rent a cheap villa and I'm gonna spend 30 days on my butt, not sailing, not going on too many adventures. I'll still get a few in there, but mostly I wanna be focusing on editing because I gotta tell you guys, it kind of isn't great trying to edit and sail and do adventures and fix things and manage a social media. It's like three full-time jobs wrapped up into one. It's a lot of work. And a big reason why I'm taking this 30 day break is to give myself a little breather because I've been sailing nonstop the last five months here. This break in Lupron will really help me reset and get ready for what comes next. I've been sailing now for five months, living every day on the anchor until I got to this marina. So I'm a little bit beaten up and honestly could use this break because what comes next is a 100 day off grid survival challenge. That's right, I'm gonna be sailing throughout the Bahamas, but I'm not allowed to use any restaurants, grocery stores, uh, gas stations, marinas, nothing like that. Only what I bring, only what's on the boat. I will have internet, of course, but technically being off grid, it just means you don't have power or electricity coming from the grid. And I'm not gonna be making my own water. I'm gonna be making my own power. And I'm gonna be having a ton of fun. And yes, I'm gonna be spearfishing again. So as well, this 30 days is gonna give me a break to let my system clear out this toxin. I can't wait to see what adventures my sailboat adventure board is gonna bring me to next. And I hope you join me. So I'll see you out there on the next adventure. Cheers. Thanks for joining me on this adventure. I hope you feel inspired to begin adventures of your own. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. For an exclusive, in-depth look at this adventure lifestyle, and to further support my channel, become a member of my Patreon crew. Link in the description. I'll see you on the next adventure.